Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. James Giordano, and he is the chief of the Neuroethics Study Program and professor in the Department of Neurology and Biochemistry at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. In this episode, we talk a lot about basically the neuroethics that come along with the development of this technology. Now, we talk a lot about the neurotechnology in medicine, public life, global health, and even military applications. We talk a lot about potential hacking and malicious intent, people with malicious intent. And I found this to be really interesting. This was the first neuroethicist we've had on the show. And I've really enjoyed this conversation, not so much about the science, but about where we're heading and what it means for the world. So hopefully you enjoy it as well. And we'll have a little bit of concluding remarks on the other side. You know, the field of neuroethics, actually, as a titular field, is a little more than 15 years old. People look to the year 2002 to say, well, that was its its formal birthing, so to speak, where it, it launched from the idea that was being bantered around in academia into something that was far more publicly visible. I think the, the critical point, if you will, the turning point, was that the late William Sapphire, the New York Times journalist, used the term neuroethics at a Dana Foundation conference in California. And as we like to say, it, it was like throwing a match onto dry brush. The, the term suddenly became very, very popular on the lips, not only of those people who are involved in scholarship and research, but also the public. What are the ethical issues that are generated in and from the uses of brain science and technology in a variety of applications? Certainly medicine, but also an increasingly public life, uh, wellness applications, lifestyle applications, which then gets us into the idea of optimization, enablement, enhancement, and, of course, increasingly in the military. And this has been a long-standing issue, the concept of dual use or dual use research of concern. But uh, an, an additional aspect of neuroethics that I think is of interest, and certainly not in any way unrelated to the idea of looking at ethical, legal, and social issues that are generated by the brain sciences, is, is another concept of neuroethics. You know, one of the, the interesting points of neuroethics is that the field has been framed by a number of scholars and practitioners who combine brain science and ethics, or ethics and brain science. And one of them was a, a cognitive scientist and philosopher whose name is Adina Roskies. And Roskies has looked to what she had referred to as two traditions or, or two areas of emphasis of neuroscience, one being the ethics of neuroscience, but the other, colloquially, being the neuroscience of ethics. And this is interesting because what's really happened is that the brain sciences have become a very useful tool to begin to explore the physiological basis of moral psychology, which of course was a psychological application of moral philosophy. So one area of, quote, neuroethics engages neuroscientific studies of moral cognition, moral emotions, and moral behaviors. But my point has been, and one of the things I've tried to argue, is that you can't really do one without the other, you know? You, you can't do the neuroscience of anything, whether it's the neuroscience of moral cognition or the moral science of kabuki theater, whatever, without examining how you're doing the neuroscience and what you're using the neuroscience for. So, of course, these two things are interactive. So, um, yeah, so what are some of the, the questions in this? I mean, like, uh, we, we've gotten to this level where we can do this multiple progressive observation, something like this. And, and so what are, what are some of the big, I don't know, issues or something in this, in this field or at, the, at the moment? Well, you know, I think if you look at what neuroscience is attempting to do, the, probably the 800-pound the gorilla in the room is what has been called the proverbial hard question. In other words, how does brain do mind, or perhaps better, how does a mind consciousness occur in brain? We still don't have the answer to that. I mean, at very, very best, what we're doing is tangentially approaching it, but it is being very, very difficult to actually explore that, although a number of research laboratories, in fact, are. I have the great fortune of working with a group of colleagues in the European Union Human Brain Project, and one of the actual dedicated projects is indeed looking at mechanisms of consciousness utilizing a whole host of neuroscientific tools and techniques. But it remains elusive in many ways. It's very difficult to try to understand how the great stuff of thought, emotions, ideas of self arise from the gray stuff 
of the brain. So that's an issue. And of course, related to that and somewhat derivative is that we're using the brain sciences to assess brain structure and function. And that's not an esoteric task. What we're doing with that is we're then saying, okay, these are indeed images, if you will, or assessments of what represents, quote, a normal brain or an abnormal brain. But these distinctions are not simply relegated to the scientific silo. These then expand a bit out of the medical framework, not only to define who is medically normal or abnormal in neurology and psychiatry and psychology and so forth, but they have a larger import anthropologically, sociologically, politically, and in some cases legally. And then the question becomes, can we utilize these neuroscientific assessments in those enterprises? This then gets us into a relatively new field, which is referred to as neuro law, which is beginning to engage the brain sciences to try to determine such things as individuals' capacity and therefore their legal competence. And in some cases, examine whether or not they're trying to deceive or tell the truth. And in other cases, try to look so boldly as to say, number one, might they be culpable? Are they guilty of certain things? Are there brain patterns that would be representative of an individual trying to deceive and therefore leading the trier of fact to think, well, maybe they're guilty? And then in other cases, even to be predictive, is this an abnormal brain or pattern of effects, for example, in a brain that would be highly suggestive of an individual's vulnerability to various acts of aggressiveness or violence and so forth? And then on the other hand, it's not just a question of assessing the brain. I like to tell my students that if you think of brain sciences, think of three A's, the ability to access the brain, the ability to assess the brain, and then as we were just talking about, the ability to affect the brain. And assessing and affecting the brain, I think, are sort of like the left hand and the right hand. Characteristically, humans are tool users. And, you know, we don't turn over rocks just to see what's underneath there. We turn over rocks because we're either going to use the rock or what's underneath. Same is true with our assessments of the brain. We're not simply looking into the brain to try to determine what's normal or abnormal, what's involved in a disease process, or perhaps even what's involved in wellness processes to make us better. We then target those things and then harness these tools to be able to then affect the brain, which is sort of a politically correct way of saying control and manipulate certain brain functions. And of course, those brains exist in people and animals. And the larger implication is dealing with things like brain control and mind control. On the other hand, on the assessment side, it's brain assessment and mind reading. So right there, you know, that opens a, a pretty big window, if not a proverbial Pandora's box of implications. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like a lie detector times 100 and, and potentially getting to this world of minority report where you can predict a crime before it even happens and potentially be thrown in jail, you know, and you haven't even done anything because in five years you're going to do something, something along these lines, right? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Here in the United States, um, there are, are defined standards that allow the applicability of certain things in courts of law. Probably the one that is most well known is the Daubert standard that comes out of a, a legal case called Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. And uh, the Daubert standard allows for sort of five criteria that either an expert witness or some level of expertise would have to essentially pass for it to be tenable to be used in a court of law. And to date, there's been some issues with neuroscientific information about brain scans and patterns of neurological activity being able to meet and pass the Daubert standard. But that's just as much an opportunity as it is a challenge. The opportunity is, as we've said in some of our writing, not so much about what neuroscience can offer to the law, nor perhaps other disciplines as well, but ultimately what these disciplines will ask of the brain sciences. So it really becomes a bi-directional conversation, if you will, where various disciplines are saying, we need the brain sciences to do A, B, and C, X, Y, and Z. And as a consequence of that, what will end up happening is the brain sciences are off to develop in just these trajectories. So I think what you're seeing is increased windows of both opportunity and increased viabilities of use in a whole host of different applications that go beyond simply research or medicine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, these these um, technologies will be improving and increasing all the all the time. And after a few decades, it's not it's not a question of if; it's a question of when, really. Agreed, agreed. You know, you you, you brought up another point that I think was really very interesting. You, you brought up Minority Report, and of course, this sort of gets into the idea of what's neuroscience fact and neuroscience fiction. And I think there is something of a bit of an obligation 
of individuals who are doing fictional work to be able to try to represent at least kernels of truth about what neuroscience can do as a means of public education. We've talked a bit about this in some of our work, and there is an ongoing discourse that looks exactly at these issues. What are the obligations of the media, not fiction as well as perhaps the mainstream media, to be able to report accurately or develop viable fiction that's able to depict these issues in brain science in such a way that it educates the public. And I think we're going to be seeing more of that too, which is very exciting. Yeah, something like, um, you know, filmmakers have a, a responsibility to accurately depict it in order to teach the public. I mean, because that could be one of the only or one of the few exposures that some of the public have to some of these technologies and some of the implications of these technologies. So got to make that, that got to make that impression good. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I've been encouraged because there has been an ongoing discourse between brain scientists and the Directors Guild of America. That's been ongoing. The National Academies has a wonderful program that's called C, the Science and Entertainment Exchange. And I, I've had the opportunity to participate in that along with some very esteemed colleagues. And it's been good because what we've seen is a real acceptance of that obligation and, of course, that opportunity to provide information to the public through fictional media, but to do so in a way that informs and educates, but then also challenges the public to think about these ethical issues that could arise from the science in the near future. And I think that's important to do. Exactly. So um, I, I, I have a question, too. I don't know if you talk about this so much, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about the, the whole idea of neuroethics and uh, its relation to hacking. So, I mean, let's say you have some kind of brain implant or, you know, some kind of organ stimulator implant or something like this. Um, how does hacking uh, fall into this? And, and what, are the, what are the ethics involved in this? Uh, it's a very good question. I think increasingly what we're looking at is biohacking as a unique domain of applications of science. You know, you, you can't really beat the drum in an enthusiastic way for things like open innovation, open science, community science, without recognizing, like any form of science, that it, it can be somewhat two-faced. I mean, we see this in a very Yanusian profile. It's like the face of Janus. On one side, there are some great things that occur within and as a consequence of open science and community science, the, the quote, hacking community. The, the do-it-yourself community, for example, can make incredible inroads in being able to develop innovation, invention, and then shape, if you will, the field in reciprocity what's going on in the mainstream. But the, the mere act of do-it-yourself also opens at least the possibility for the fact that there may be some loss of regulatory control, governance, oversight, and of course the implication there may be safety, not only for the researchers themselves, but of runaway effects doing something that ordinarily might not be done, and as a consequence, therefore, things getting out of control, getting out of hand, and perhaps not being controllable. Now, that's not to say, of course, in any way, that the do-it-yourself community is a group of charlatans. They're not. Many of them will utilize uh, broad-based institutional, institutional review boards that are available. So, for example, Northern IRB, Western IRB, and they will actually use these review boards to check, monitor, and approve their science. They'll also be somewhat internally governed, where a group of individuals who are working within that biohacking community, do-it-yourself community, will self-police and recognize that there are directions they can go, and things they can do, and things they shouldn't. But like any other community, what you tend to find is it's broadly distributed, and there are possibilities both for inadvertent misuse of the science and or things that go wrong. And in some cases, intentional misdirection of the science, perhaps not even in a malevolent way, just that let's see what happens if we do this, it's never been gone before, let's not ask permission, and in other cases, a disruptive way. And let's face it, individuals' agendas can be everything from just curiosity and some form of scientific agnosticism to really having an agenda to be socially, publicly disruptive, not necessarily in a destructive way, but perhaps in a disruptive way. But you, know, you are dealing with life sciences, and that can be problematic. We have to look at the safety issues that go along with that, and also the delicacy of how we would govern that and guide that, and yet at the same time not stultify 
innovation or invention. So it is, it's a curious issue, but I think one that certainly is coming to the fore ever more as the do-it-yourself community grows. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if hackers, you know, hack into your computer or even a bank account, okay, you know, your computer's gone, your computer's fried or your bank account is emptied, but that's not nearly as bad as having a pacemaker <laughs> and just having somebody be like, okay, that's going to go to a thousand beats per minute or something like this. Just, you know, and boom, you're dead. Um, so what do you, I mean, I, I really like this open source ideas and, and because I think that's a much more natural way to progress and uh, kind of involves everybody. But you you kind of made it sound like, okay, let's say 0.1% of the people are malevolent and 1% are going to do like bad things or something like this. But if you have bigger numbers of people in the field or people tinkering with something, they're going to mess something up and going to break it. So so what do you kind of foresee? What, what's the answer to this? How do, you, how do you keep things kind of open source and allow a lot of people to work on it, lo- lots of minds to work on it and keep it closed enough that people don't have their hearts explode. <laughs> You've certainly described the challenge that the field offers. And I, like you, think that the field is challenging in, in a very good way. I think that there's a lot of things that can be done with this open science and open innovation. And I think it can be done in reciprocity. I think there are certain things that institutional science offers, perhaps the ability to engage oversight and at least keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on, but not necessarily a finger in the pie. And what I mean here is the idea of an institutional review board that at least provides some oversight to get necessary checks in the block that perhaps may not even be thought of by some of the individuals who are doing some of the do-it-yourself stuff or or the individuals who are doing yourself really want that level of backing to say, yes, we have submitted this to an institutional review board. It has been reviewed. It has been approved. And this provides at least a, a relative level of checks and balances as to where it's going to go and the possibilities that could arise. As sort of a set of if-then statements, if you will. If this happens, then we should notify people. If this happens, we should stop. If this happens, we can proceed, etc. It provides, at very, very least, an external oversight upon initiation, and perhaps also some data monitoring, not in any way to constrain the innovation or inventiveness, but simply to make sure that, like in so many other efforts, the checks are in the block. And the reason I advocate that is that I think that do-it-yourself science really can open tremendous vistas for innovation in a lot of different ways. Uh, it, It provides a sort of community mindset, if you will, to individuals who may be out of the box thinkers. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And there's a lot of things that are inherently good with that. But trying to capture that and at the same time recognize that there's great power in what the neurosciences and technology can do and recognize that with that power also comes the capability and responsibility to use it in ways that are both technically right and attempt to use it in ways that are ethically and legally good, I think represents a key obligation of science, irrespective of wherever it's done. So I think you've made a very good point, is that as the community grows, the need for internal oversight, guidance, and communication becomes greater. This is not just a closet community. It's a real thing. And then the question is, you then have co-community engagement. You have the community of the do-it-yourselfers who then may engage with the community of commercial enterprises to then translate what they're doing into something that may be commercially viable. And or you also have interface with the academic research community that may be operating with certain constraints and latitudes and so forth that in some cases can be positively cooperative and in other cases can be delimiting to either of the two communities. So I think that that level at very least of communication is a good step forward. And communication towards some level of collaboration, it need not be intrinsic collaboration where there's a a tight, tight interweaving and therefore constraint, but collaboration that is essentially reciprocally beneficial. And what I mean by that is it, it maximizes the benefits of one or both, and in many cases, delimits or compensates for the constraints that may be offered. So I think that would be a way forward. Sounds great, not necessarily easy to do. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It sounds great. But what, what do you foresee, I guess, or what would you um, hope for uh, a governmental institution that does this? Or even like a, not like a national government, like a supranational, like a UN or something like this? Or would you think like a private a business uh, would be better suited for something like this? You know, I think it could go in almost any direction. I think that there's a, a relative suspicion, if you will, uh, on certain aspects of do-it-yourself community about governmental oversight. And there's been a bit of pushback, although I must tell you there's also been a very strong informative collaboration here in the United States between the do-it-yourself community and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
And let me explain the reason for that, because I know about this intimately well. The reason for that is that the do-it-yourself community also has certain vulnerabilities. Let me explain. The do-it-yourselfer is very often working with certain forms of venture capital or other areas of support that then allow their science to progress. And there are forces, both state actors as well as non-state actors, that see the do-it-yourself community as a possible vector to manipulate and guide science. And again, although the do-it-yourself community, I truly believe, operates under a maxim of trying to do good and ethically sound science, let's face it, the reality is that there are individuals out there who recognize the power of science, particularly the biosciences, and look to infiltrate that on those ways that direct it into ways that may be capricious at least and nefarious at worst. So understanding the vulnerability of that community to that level of infiltration and effect, I think, has been important. And there has been a very good and solid cooperative relationship between the Federal Bureau of Investigation and aspects of the do-it-yourself community to engage some level of cursory and formal oversight, or at least reporting, this is what's going on, this is where we're going. And certainly, I think, keeping um, the antenna well-tuned to the possibility of capricious or nefarious infiltration. And that's been an important thing to do. I must add to this that some of the newer techniques of gene editing, like CRISPR or Cas9, also present some unique opportunities to modify biological organisms and or modify biological structures and functions of things genetically that can be very innovative, clearly. And with such innovation, like anything else, you kind of open a much broader palette. And with any palette, you have things that can work in very, very good ways. And you have some things that can be problematic and in some cases just downright dangerous. So these types of innovations that come from what I'll call the mainstream scientific side that can be uptaken, utilized, and exploited, and I mean that in a positive way, exploiting for their maximum potential by a do-it-yourself community, I think just only open the field wider for the need for ongoing communication and collaboration. This seems like very tenuous, and, and you were gonna we're only gonna figure out maybe after the fact of of what's possible or what what we can do. But I don't know. I kind of have the feeling that um, you know you're gonna have bad actors. I mean, potentially, I don't know, like some somewhere in the world, let's say, I don't know, Afghanistan or something like this. Once once it gets like really once it gets really easy. I mean, CRISPR. Like once it literally gets into high school classrooms, then you then you have these lawless uh, areas and. And doesn't matter what laws you have or what agreements you have, somebody somewhere is going to do something bad. I mean, kind of like, um, you know, creating viruses, something like this. I mean, there is the dark web, right? And and uh, there are many people who will make tons of viruses and, and completely blow everything up if they can, just because it's so easy. It's it's available to them. So so how do we kind of protect against that? Like people who are outside the law, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what kind of uh, governmental institution or what kind of business, you know, is, is uh, checking all this. How do we how do we kind of protect against that as well? Uh, that's that's a much deeper question, because I think what you really get into here is is three things. Number one, are there the necessary regulations, guidelines, and governances in place? And I think that's that's debatable. I mean, clearly, if you're working with biologicals and chemicals, you take a look at things like the Biological Toxins Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Conventions, and a variety of international signatory treaties. And that's an area that I work in, as you know, quite a bit. But here, too, I mean, there, there, are, there are holes in that fabric. Things can get by for example, neurological and neurotechnological devices, aren't well represented there. As well, certain agents that may be relatively benign can be modified, and therefore they don't necessarily pop up on just a categorical listing. So the question then becomes, do we then deal with techniques and capabilities? That's been bantered around. But you've raised a good point. There are plenty of people who behave and color within the line, so to speak. They, they go by the rules. But very often, there are also individuals who may not be aware of those rules, number one, uh, pure what I'll call naivete, or the idea of trying to be inventive and as a consequence they drift from going in between the lines. Uh, they sort of say, well, I'm going to take this direction versus that direction, and in so doing they open up a proverbial can of worms and don't realize that they're doing something that's prescribed. And then, as you say, there are also individuals who may have some real intent. And the intent may not necessarily be malevolent intent. It just may be, let's push the envelope and see how far it goes. And then there's always a smaller population who say, yes, let's do that in a way that is malevolent because we want to push the envelope so as to create something we don't care what it is as long as it's disruptive or destructive. And this will either gain attention to what it is we're doing or evoke some social effect, whatever that may be. And your point there is, is it comes to the issue because this then gets to the 
level two and three. Level two is how do you surveil these individuals? What level of survey do you need to have? There are those who've argued for a, quote, deep surveillance, and that essentially engages some form of intelligence, literally intelligence, intel, um, oversight, engagement, um, some level of informational or even community infiltration. But this then raises the specter of, are you impinging on individuals' rights and freedoms? And on one hand, the answer may be yes. This then gets us into the issue of looking at privacy versus protection. And what are people willing to trade to be able to afford protection, both to self and others, and yet at the same time not compromise their privacy? This is an issue that I certainly can't answer, but I think that the question, the problem is real. And then the third really gets down to the the notion you had alluded to earlier, which is what kind of body might be a governing body or an oversight body? Is it governmental? Is it non-governmental? And I think the answer here is probably yes. I think there needs to be a governmental component to it because the governmental component then allows the articulation of guidelines and regulations for policy and law, and policy and law have strength. But I also think that determining what the ethical postures are for this conduct become important. And here now you're getting into things like academic ethicists and individuals within the respective communities that may have interest in ethics and to some extent local as well as national and international laws, but creating an informed discourse that ultimately leads to regulation guidelines and policies. And then of course the communities themselves, because what you don't want to do is just impose some kind of external regulation that is then going to be not accepted, not embraced, and not articulated by the community. So that third level would need to be some type of community organization within the do-it-yourself groups that provide community direction, community oversight, and policing. And let's face it, my answer to that is quite simple. It's not a question of imposing anything that shouldn't be there. If, in fact, the do-it-yourself community recognizes their obligation as scientists, and they are. I mean, these are valid, well-trained scientists, well-trained on a variety of levels. Sometimes they're autodidacts. Other times they've been formally trained in academic programs. Very often it's a combination of both. Science is a profession. And one of the hallmarks of a profession is that it is a community that possesses intrinsic and inherent educational training and skill capabilities that makes it different and unique, but also accepts responsibility for self-policing and governance. And so I think that as the do-it-yourself community becomes a realized, realistic, and accepted community, a way of doing innovative and open science, there's also the incumbent responsibility to take on that role of professionalism and self-police. So I think it's some combination of those three together. But the hardest part that you alluded to and that we're discussing now is the surveillance piece. Because, again, this gets into very deep issues that we probably won't have the time to discuss here, but issues of what represents viable protection, again, of the researchers themselves as well as the community, and what is the necessary respect and uh, adherence to individuals' privacy. A, a debatable issue, certainly contentious. And so I guess this is, um, I guess we're talking about like individual, um, I don't know, nefariousness or something like this. But what about if it's more organized, like a bigger group, or let's say even a state government, what what would, um, uh, I guess, a bioweapon of, of brain machine interfaces look like? And, and how would that be possible to stop? And how likely do you think that would be? Well, how many hours have we got to talk about this? I mean, you know, now, now we've, we've really gone over to, I think, quote, the dark side, if you will. But you know, here, let, let me kind of equate your, your listening audience What's what's been going on. The idea of harnessing science and technology for some form of weaponization is not new. I mean, we can look literally throughout history and see that the group, the agent, the country that develops the, the most sophisticated and capable weapons characteristically feels that it's able to exert the most power. Again, historically, we can look back into the ages. If we just focus on the 20th century and we recognize the 20th century has been seen as the century of mechanization and technology, we see a progressive, a very iterative set of developments where science and technology then is translated, if you will, into the medical and warfare, the, the military and warfare sphere, moving from the medical silo into that sphere, the idea of chemicals, biologicals, etc. Even more sophisticated weapons that then utilize medical science to be able to determine what is the most effective weapon in a variety of different domains, whether 
with regard to stopping power, wounding power, or killing power. So increasingly, you've seen this interface between science, technology, with medicine balanced precariously in between, and military uptake and uses in warfare. And when I say warfare, you have to consider the two aspects of warfare. There's what we'll call the soft side, which is things like intelligence and psychological operations and getting to know and or affect your enemy uh, somewhat more, more subtly. And the, quote, hard side, which are your traditional weapons with regard to incurring morbidity or mortality, what we like to refer to as, you know, bullets and bombs type of things. And, of course, on the scientific side, what we're now looking at is bugs, drugs, toxins, and devices. And if we just look at those criteria, drugs, bugs, toxins, and devices, the brain sciences increasingly have made contribution to the development of things that can be utilized in those ways. A whole host of pharmaceuticals that can affect not only warfighter and intelligence operator performance, essentially performance optimizers that may make them more vigilant, less fatigued, more capable in certain areas of the performance of, of various jobs that they do within their military occupations but also pharmacologicals that could be used against another, against an adversary, to be able to decrement their performance, change their cognition, emotions, change their willing to fight, or in some cases, incur morbidity or even mortality. With regard to bugs, the idea of microbial warfare has long been known, so the use of, of neuroactive viruses and microbes, forms of biological agents, certainly is, is not only entertainable, but is viable, it's real, and there are whole categories of microbes and viruses that are seen as viable neuroweapons. And of course, here we reopen the door for what CRISPR-Cas9 might be able to do to take what may be essentially a relatively inert or benign organism and make it far more virulent, far more morbid, and far more lethal. As regards toxins, a number of different toxins, and many of them that are actually used in neuroscientific research that affect the flow of ions across membranes, affect membrane stability, affect neurological function in other ways, can be weaponized. And these, of course, are defined in the Biological Toxins and Weapons Convention. But here, too, we can use certain modifications, not only to the toxins themselves, perhaps, but also to the way the toxins are then prepared, the toxins can be let loose, that make them somewhat more stable over a longer period of time and increase their weaponizability, if you will. The last area, the idea of devices, is where I think we're really beginning to see some renewed interest in the brain sciences and increased specific interest in, hmm, we didn't think about that up until quite recently. And this is where you really begin to look at devices that may be used to alter the sensorium, devices that are used to alter neurological function, to change cognition. And let's face it, you know, we're recording this in October 2017, and this is something that is conspicuously in the news right now. What we have to do is take a look at the events that have happened in the United States Embassy in Havana and recognize that there is a strong possibility that there was some type of neuroweapon that was leveraged there, and this was some type of either sonic disruptor or electromagnetic pulse disruptor or even a combination of some drug with some type of a device that was able to incur these effects. And again, what you're seeing is a pattern of morbidity. So you've raised a good point. Where can these things go? And those are the general categories. The earlier point you made about who's doing it, uh, obviously it is possible that the do-it-yourself community could contribute to this. But I think that where we're really looking more closely is the fact that nation states have dedicated programs that are focal to developing the brain sciences for military and warfare applications. And the United States has programs that are specifically dedicated, as do many of its allies, as do a number of other nation states, some of these that are not necessarily uh, working in conjunction with the United States, the West, etc. And I think these things need to be appreciated. Looking at the brain as a possible 21st century battlescape is a very realistic view and one that is certainly being appreciated by a number of groups, not least of which the National Academies, that between 2008 and 2012 and 13 have recognized many of the brain sciences are indeed, quote, ready for prime time with regard to their military and warfare uses and applications. And as I mentioned, this is something that is international in scope. So clearly, I think we're seeing a broader palette of potential applications. 
Yeah, definitely. It sounds like uh, it sounds like a scary landscape to to be facing, you know, and and kind of unproven and and lots of lots of new things being being exposed or being started up right now that, that makes uh, the the war the war ground a little bit more um, dangerous and and uh, you know uncertain. But I guess. Um, how how certain or how how likely is this? I mean, I would argue that the information technology, the internet, computers haven't been really used to their full advantage or to their full potential um, in terms of warfare over the last what twenty years, thirty years. So, uh, do you think uh, do you think that this might also not be utilized and and it's just kind of sitting there potentially for somebody to like pick it up and destroy the world one day or and and that that uh, but that probably wouldn't happen. Well, you know. I- it's a good question. I mean, it, it, I, 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 I hesitate only because of, of the profundity of the question. What you're, what you're really asking is, when are we going to get to that, that set of either tipping points or tripping hazards when now the cat proverbially is let out of the bag? Uh, we have seen, I think, an iterative use of the vehicle of the internet and the, the cybersphere as being able to manipulate not only individuals, but in many cases, whole nations. I mean, one can certainly take a look at some of the things that Russia has done over the past couple of years and say, well, this represents clearly the use of the internet as a weaponizable source. And when we're talking about a a weapon here, we're talking about a way of contending against others in directional purposes. Clearly, the internet can become that. But you've raised another very important point, which is that these types of sciences and technologies do not exist in isolation. Increasingly, there is intent and direction to utilize the brain sciences together with other sciences. And in fact, that approach is actually called something. It's called advanced integrative scientific convergence. So this convergent model that de-silos the sciences, I think also allows for an increased palette of possibility and potential uses. And with that, what you find is a variety of different applications that range from the subtle to the very severe do I think this is going to be something that creates sort of a, a new neuro Armageddon? Well, no, I don't. And, and I don't necessarily see these things as weapons of mass destruction. I certainly see them as viable weapons for mass disruption. These are disruptive agents. And disruption can occur on a variety of levels. They can occur on an individual level where you're targeting key individuals who then may have power effects within a group, population, community, nation. You can target groups of individuals uh, in a confined space to then alter a variety of things what are called ripple effects. Case in point, perhaps what we're seeing at the U.S. Embassy in Havana, a a key set of individuals were affected in some way, and we haven't determined whether or not that was purposive or that was environmental, but let's just make the assumption that it were purposive, it it was intentional. Well, then what you've done is you've affected a key group of individuals. X number of individuals. But the ripple effect is a disruption of the potential relationships between two nations, the United States and Cuba. So here you're seeing the disruptive effect of affecting a few individuals and then having that ripple off more broadly into the political realm, into the social realm, into the global realm, etc. Then, of course, there's also the possibility of incurring public health effects where you literally will engage, disrupt, affect, make sick, or perhaps even render mortal, kill, a few group of targeted individuals throughout a population, but then you utilize the internet as a vector to spread misinformation, generate public fears, and what you do is you cause a ripple effect within the public health system that in many ways can disrupt the level of trust between the people, their government, the people in the public health system, and produces a crashing effect where now you have floods of the worried well, for example, that may then suddenly feel they have something, they've been exposed to something. And let's be real, there are already those fears that there are these potential uses of the brain sciences. Um, I hear that not infrequently, various lectures that I've given, people who come up to me after the lecture and go, you know... I think I know someone who, and then fill in the blanks, or it plays to individuals' sense of protection, or in some cases even, let's be very realistic, paranoia. And again, I think that the idea of unleashing the brain sciences, not necessarily alone, but in tandem with other approaches that can create these disruptive effects, is probably the type of pattern we're going to see. And as you said earlier, it's not a question of if. I am convinced it's a question of when, and if recent events prove to be telling, I think that that when is now, or at very, very least, will probably be in the near future.
Wow. So maybe the worst thing, rather than um, I don't know, like sending a biological weapon or you know hacking into all the devices, is is a, a, a much more easier thing to do. Is like hypochondria on a, on a scale, and that can be much more disruptive than much easier than, than anything else. Yeah, I, I I think right. I think that's that's probably the type of thing that at least initially will gain the ripple effects that are going to be most dramatic. Uh, and then you know you just you can literally sharpen the proverbial spear from there. Uh, how you use these things and what scenarios against individuals against groups, and of course, as we said, the the other issue is the the idea of devices and even hacking into devices. Increasingly, what we know is that there's an interest in deep brain stimulation, nerve stimulating devices, and these things all utilize microelectronics. And so, one of the issues that continues to be brought up is whether or not these types of devices that engage neurological and brain control, at least on some level, are penetrable, are hackable, and what that might mean. And so I think there are a number of at least considerations, if not concerns, that need to be entertained when looking as we're moving to advance the brain sciences. In the Absolutely. So um, what would you recommend that the, the audience do? Like, How do they contribute to this um, discussion and, and maybe shape the direction that it's going? Well, thank you. That's a wonderful question. You've really given me a forum. That was You played the perfect straight man for me. Thanks. I appreciate that. You know, I in no way to be at all braggadocio here, and I, that, but to, to simply advocate that I, I work with a wonderful group of people, both here in the United States and internationally. And one of the programs that I work with is the European Union Human Brain Project. And part of the Human Brain Project has a subgroup that is actually looking at key neuroethical issues that arise not only from the work of the Human Brain Project in Europe, but internationally as a consequence of the, the trajectories and, and progress of, of brain science writ large. And one of the things we're looking at is dual use, this type of thing, the, the, uh, the idea that the brain sciences can be used not only for medical purposes, clearly, but also for purposes outside the clinic, lifestyle and wellness, personal cognitive and behavioral optimization and enhancement, and of course, military and political uses as well. And the, the point that comes to the fore through much of these labors and the efforts of, of our group in the in the Human Brain Project, as well as others, again, here in the United States and elsewhere, has been that, quite frankly, education represents the key. And this is multidimensional education. I think there's the need to educate the scientists themselves about the possible consequences of the research that they're engaging. And I've been, in fact, very enthused and encouraged by the fact that there is an ongoing effort in academic programs to embrace a maxim of no new neuroscience without neuroethics. But that neuroethics must be neuroscientifically informed. It's not just a question of sort of sitting under a tree and philosophical navel gazing. I mean, there's a real place for applied philosophy there, and this is not esoteric. It doesn't, it doesn't take the philosophers out of the discussion. It conjoins them ever more tightly to understand the philosophical issues that can arise from even medical brain science. We're offering the opportunity to treat and cure certain things, but what does that mean for social strata, public regard, who gets treated, who doesn't, etc.? But clearly, it's not just a question of, of educating and training the professions. It's also a question of educating the public. What can the brain sciences really do? What can they not do? What are the limitations? And the idea there is to really foster, I think, a deeper appreciation of what's real and what's fictional. And as we said earlier, I think there's a great place for fiction. And it serves a function that, that we like to think of as, as what the Greeks used to refer to as idola, which is presenting fiction in a way that gets to the essence of the question or the problem that you want the public to think about because they need to be prepared for this as this iteratively develops and essentially hatches. So again, I think there's a place for neuroscience fiction, but I think that there is a definitive place for clarity of neuroscientific fact. Um, as the audience will probably tell by my accent, uh, I grew up in New York City. And there was a clothier in New York City that used to use as their maxim, an educated consumer is our best customer. And I like that. I think that that's really important to understand the role of the brain sciences to the public. I think that an educated public is probably the best way to appropriate the idea of these ethical, legal, and social issues so as to get that public awareness and to get that public feedback. So that there isn't misfostered worry and apprehension and these visions of dystopia, but there also isn't this over expectation and anticipation of some neuro nonsensical idea that the brain sciences will make everything better. I think that that critical balance exists in between, and that's an ongoing discourse. 
Definitely. I, I cannot agree more. You know, educated population, that's definitely better for the world. So, Dr. James Giordano, thank you so much for uh, this very helpful session and for this kind of neural podcast. If people want to find out more about you or get in contact, how do they do that? They can reach me via the my link at Georgetown, and that's very easy. They can just go to www.georgetown.edu, type in my name, my faculty page comes up, and if they want to reach me, certainly they can reach me through the Georgetown website, and I, I encourage your listeners to get in touch with me. I'm, I'm happy to engage that discourse. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey guys, hopefully you enjoyed that. Yeah, I found that really interesting. I mean, as I said in the beginning, first time a neuroethicist has been on the show and I really enjoyed it. So a lot of the things that he brought up were very thought provoking and we really have to think about this as we go further along in the neural implant field. Um, I don't know though, I, I kind of feel like he didn't give so many answers. I mean, obviously this is a very difficult thing, very difficult uh, set of questions, but I don't know. I, I kind of wish that he was like, okay, this is what we have to do <laughs> versus kind of like, oh yeah, we should talk about this and see. But um, regardless, this is a conversation that we need to have. And as I said in the episode as well, I don't think we can really stop it. I mean, honestly, it really doesn't take so many people. It can take like a small country like Slovenia or something like this. And they're just like, nope. I don't care what you guys are saying. I'm going to just go ahead and, you know, study this and go as far as we can with the neural implants. So I think we have to basically play to the lowest common denominator and basically allow everything because otherwise, if we're like too restrictive, then, you know, people, other countries, different areas are going to rebel and the, the result might be even worse. So I thought this was really interesting. Let me know what you think and write to me, neural implant podcast at gmail.com all one word and um yeah let's get a conversation started if you if you know a guest or if you think you would be a good guest for the show please write to me as well and uh, i would love to have you on i'm always open to suggestions and i really 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 enjoy finding out about more people because i thought i knew all the people i thought i knew a lot of people in the field but turns out there's a really a lot of people in the field and uh, i'm learning more and more every day okay hopefully you enjoy this and until next week this is the neural implant podcast hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new bringing together different fields in novel ways until next time on the neural implant podcast